Good evening. What does a service member become when they are no longer serving in the military? Transition to civilian life can be the most difficult time in a veteran's life. Tonight, we talk about making the transition. Tonight's very special shadow box belongs to Lieutenant Denny Briggs. Denny was born in 1927 in Big Lake, Minnesota. He served in the Navy during World War II from 1945 to 1946, and then again during the Korean War from 1950 to 1958. After his service, Denny continued his lifelong study of psychology and sociology. Denny was a friend of Veterans Voices and will be missed. We honor his service and dedicate this show to his memory. Welcome to Veterans Voices, a monthly television show that explores important issues that affect the veterans community. We encourage you to participate in the conversation tonight. We couldn't have this conversation without you. If you'd like to ask a question, call us at 925-313-1170. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One or email us veteransvoices at contracostatv.org. We would love to hear from you. Good evening. I'm Erin Esquire, and this evening on Veterans Voices, we'll look at veterans that are making the transition. We'll talk with veterans about their experiences and organizations dedicated to helping veterans transition to civilian life. So first up, I'd like to welcome veterans Ron Payne, Dre Santos, and Kyrie Jordan to the show. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank hey, you for doing? having us. How you we, doing? We're, we're excited to have you guys on tonight. And um, I'm actually going to pick on Dre. I'm going to start with Dre because we've actually had her on the show before, as well as Ron. Kyrie, you're new to the show, and uh, we are excited to have you on as well. But we'll start with Dre. Dre, you are a Marine veteran, and I know we've got some photos that might highlight some of your service. If you want to kick us off here with this conversation about your transition story from the Marines, um, into the civilian life that you're experiencing today. We'd love to start with that. Right on, Erin. Thank you for having me. Um, so um, I joined the Marine Corps in 2008, uh, right after high school. And um, it was not my first choice. I was actually supposed to go to cosmetology school. So um, talk about quick left turn. Um, but I got in, I joined, and I just started rolling with it. It would definitely fit my personality. and. Um, I learned stuff about myself and my leadership and what I have to offer that I didn't know before or wouldn't have found out, you know, any other way. So um, I served for 10 years and, and I got out in 2018. And I want to say that my transition was very unexpected as far as what to expect. I went through the TAPS program just like any other um, service member does as far as getting out from active duty. And I was excited to jump into the um, into a career, into a job. I was in logistics when I was in the military. So I thought I could get into any logistics job that I applied for because I'm, you know, I just did 10 years of basically logistics. So that experience I thought would drive me, but I was quickly turned down um, due to a lack of basically school and a lack of a degree, which was kind of discouraging. And it led me down, um, I guess, this path where I had a lot of difficulties finding out what my identity was now that I was no longer, I didn't have that rank and I didn't have that uniform to show you show who I was, you know, like I would, like how it was in the military. So I struggled a lot with my identity and how can I do this? You know, I went from active duty to a full-time mom of three kids and, and it was, it was a difficult transition and I wasn't prepared for that part. I was prepared to go into the workforce. I was prepared to transition as far as uh, military jargon to civilian, you know, verbiage, but as far as um, being shut down and almost told no thank you or you're not qualified it was a it was a hard pill to swallow so um i think i had to do a lot of self searching and figuring out who i was and what i really wanted to do and it took a lot uh mentally to buckle down and figure it out you know on top of juggling 
uh, being a wife, on top of juggling being a stay-at-home mom. So um, I quickly turned to school because that was my, you know, one, it was a, it was a safeguard. It was a safety net because I knew I could do it and I knew there was an income behind it and that's what I needed. I needed something to get the ball rolling. And once I um, started going to school, I figured out what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it, my goals that were set. You know, I started setting goals for myself. But um, like I said, the transition period was just very unexpected, you know, mentally, um, not so much physically. Definitely appreciate you sharing that. And I noticed during your your discussion that uh, Kyrie and Ron were both, you know, doing a lot of head nodding. And uh, I'd like to hear from Kyrie, um, you know, a little bit about your experience as well. You're a Navy veteran. Definitely want to hear about your service as well and, and a bit about your transition. We have some Not a problem. Uh, right on. Definitely show the pictures. Uh, I was nodding. Uh, I definitely agree with her 100% uh, in the Navy. I went to the Navy also right after high school. So at 17, I joined. Um, in 18, I, I turned 18 in boot camp. Uh, I went in as an operations specialist. So I worked with radars and sonars and other uh, computer equipment, uh, kind of weapon systems. Won't go into too many details. Um, so that kind of sparked my interest in technology. So when I got out, I kind of knew uh, what route I wanted to go. So once I got out, I definitely got in school. I got my associate, associates in uh, IT, just a general. And then I got a bachelor's in informatics, uh, which is kind of like the movement and storage of data. I didn't know that I didn't know if that was the direction I was will be going, kind of like the movement and storage of data. It's kind of like a degree uh, that was offered with the college that I was uh, attending. Um, at the college, uh, I graduated in Georgia. Uh, I met my girlfriend in Georgia. She was actually from the Bay Area, from Oakland. Um, and she did, she did hair. Uh, so she came to Atlanta to kind of try to start up a business, a salon down there. But uh, the environment was just totally different from the Bay Area. So once I graduated, we decided to move back to the Bay Area. So uh, when I got here, it's my first time in the Bay Area. I found out it was very expensive. Uh, so even after graduating with an IT degree, I had a pretty high GPA. It was still tough breaking in the walls, trying to get into the IT field, even though this is like the IT mecca. Silicon Valley. So it was a tons of jobs. But even with the kind of experience I had in the Navy and with my college degree, I was still coming up short. Uh, so when I first got here, I took maybe like a lift job for two or three months. Uh, after lift, I did Social Security. Uh, after Social Security, I kind of I did Social Security for a while and still my my urge to kind of join the tech community was still there. So I actually joined the uh, Oak Rehab Program. Um, they assisted a lot. And also uh, going through my transition, I, I researched and I, I found out about a, a program it's called Empower, which helps veterans and actually young Americans uh, to basically earn IT certificates. So I found out that the way to break in the door is to kind of earn a certificate. So it's not really the degree. And I had a bit of experience, but it still wasn't enough. So after Empower uh, provided that that training for me and I earned my Security Plus, uh, doors open actually. Um, So I was here maybe two years before I was even, I could get an IT interview. Uh, But right after the training, uh, just the phone started ringing and I actually accepted a position at General Dynamics, which is a defense contractor. Uh, So it sounds like the path out of the military wasn't quite a clear path. And it sounds like there was a lot of um, alterations to that. Ron, we'd like to hear a little bit about your experience, but mostly maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what things did you not anticipate from your transition out of the military that you faced maybe right away and and were some of the largest obstacles? Everything. (laughs) I had a plan. I had a plan. Uh, uh, Ron Payne, uh, I came in the military in 1990 and I retired in 2016. So I'm a 26 year army uh, retired. I came in to bring the gold home to America. I originally came in to uh, join the all army team. But uh, that first year I wound up shattering my ankle. And <laughs> so I, that that never happened, but it, it, it turned into a 23 year uh, detour that was probably one of the greatest things I could have did. Yeah, that guy could run, that skinny guy, the, the 240 pound. It's not gonna happen. No gold, not even a buck. Oh, so uh, I went into the military. Uh, 
and they told me when I was gonna uh, run at first, they were like, don't worry about your MOS. They said, you're gonna work in a hospital, we'll just give you this MOS. It's called a uh, healthcare specialist. Uh, little did uh, Ron know that less than a year, uh, I wound up in Somalia. Remember that thing that called Somalia? And they said, I was like uh, looking around like, uh, what am I doing here? And they were like, uh, I said, this doesn't look like the healthcare specialist course. And they were like, oh no, you're a combat medic. And I was just looking at them like, well, I'm, not, I'm in the wrong class. And they were like, no. And you know, when you first, when before you get in the military, it's like a gotcha moment. Like we got you, you're a combat medic and you're gonna get the first experience. So my first, I deployed so many times after that. So I, I learned never to underestimate anything in the army. <laughs> so, uh, and then all of a sudden at, at uh, 26 years, you know, everybody says sooner or later, your legends got to end. So I wanted to end on, on my terms. So I was, uh, I decided to get out and go pursue something else while I have time. But uh, I had all these plans and I had this uh, great five day tap course, you know, tell you everything. And they said, oh, wait a minute, 26 years combat medic, you're gonna get a job real easy, easy in healthcare. That is negative. <laughs> that did not happen. I applied for jobs and they just looked at me like, I'm like, I'm that guy that ran across a battlefield with a with a patient. How how bad can you get? <laughs> I said, I've done some stuff that uh no doctor should trust me doing. No, <laughs> but uh it wasn't good enough, is what, mm. what I felt like. When you get that sense of I've done all this, why am I not good enough out here? Mm. Because for 26 years I was told, you know, you're Captain America, you're one of the greatest. But out here, uh, my legend ended and I was just Ron Payne. So that was probably the mental aspect that Dre and uh, Kyrie said is, is rough. And uh, then you started looking at, uh, so when I retired, I looked around and I said, what should I do? Medi the medical field isn't working for me because I'm not gonna uh, just uh, pretend like I don't know what I'm doing. So uh, I decided to go back to school. Uh, Went to Las Positas, uh, graduated with degrees in uh, political science and uh, criminal justice because I wanted to, I wanted to still do something. Every military person still had the sense of I still got to serve in some capacity, no matter what it is, customer service, healthcare, or being a voice for people is what I want to do, especially veterans. I want to deal with veterans reforms and everything to help veterans and uh, people along the way. But I could say the, the one of the most difficult things that I would advise everybody to do have a plan, have a backup plan, and then have a backup plan. Because the moment you get out, your legend ends. Do not look back to the military to help you. So uh, that's why it's very important that things like Kyrie does and Dre and all these organizations, before you get out, reach out and find them. That's what I didn't do. I didn't reach out and find all these great organizations. I didn't realize there are, uh, they throw organizations at you. And I feel as veterans, we're like, we don't need that help. Because we, in the military, you're provided perfect direction and motivation 24-7. For the first time in life, I had to be my purpose. I had to be my direction, and I had to be my motivation. And it can be dangerous because there were a lot of things, I routes I could go versus going to see a, a veteran center versus going to the VA versus going to all this stuff, and it's just being thrown at you. So you're just so messed stuff, and you're like, where's my NCO? Or where's, somebody got to tell me which way to go when, no, it's just you. So, so I, what would you I, say, I say then to, you know, Dre or Kyrie or what would you say to the young Dre, Kyrie or Ron, any of you that, you know, five years ago or three years ago was looking at that DD-214 in the AS date, you know, I, we're, we're all boot civilians, but we've got a lot of experience to offer those that are just transitioning out of the military. So what would, what would we tell, what would you tell yourselves if you were to do that experience again? exactly what Dre and Kyrie would also say, I believe, is uh, look to people that have done it already. You know, find that battle very buddy true. who's gotten out, learn from it's their mistakes, true. be, <laughs> ask them everything and don't stop. Yeah. Once you get out and you say, this is my new legend, keep looking. There's so many opportunities. And it, it's sad when I do see, I was that uh, first sergeant that saw his soldier working at McDonald's trying to survive. And he got was, like two he, minutes. Oh, sorry. So I'm so, so yeah. I, so Dre, I want to come back to you. Uh, Ron saying, seek out mentorship from others. What would you say, Dre? Uh, I definitely agree. And don't give up on yourself. You know, dealing with um, 
you know, in the Marine Corps, for me, everything was go, 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 go. And you never really stop in the moment because you're in this routine. But when you are taken out of that routine, you kind of have like stuck looking to the left and to the right, like, what do I do now? And can I do this? So don't double don't double question yourself. Just do it. You've already survived the military. You can survive civilian world as well. Just keep pressing in, keep going, set goals for yourself and don't give up on yourself, you know, because I know for my household, I have little ones looking up to me, you know, so it doesn't, it's not just about me. It's about my family. It's about my legacy that, like Ron said, that continues after I leave the military. You know, although I don't wear the rank or the uniform no more, I still have to carry on you know, and go forth because there's little ones behind me that are following, that are watching. So I, to not give up on myself, to not give up on yourself, that there is more out there, you know, and there's one thing I always said to my Marines is a closed mouth, don't get fed. And that's something you can carry on into the civilian world. If you don't ask, then you're not going to know, you're not going to get that help. So don't be afraid, humble yourself, because when you humble yourself now, you're going to reap those rewards later on. And you're going to be that much more ahead of time and ahead of your, you know, just that yourself. And you're going to look back and like, man, I'm glad that I didn't not say nothing. I'm glad that I spoke up. I'm glad that I asked for help. And I'm glad that there was resources there and available, regardless if they're thrown at us, used or not used. I'm glad that something was there to reach out and hold and grab. So, yeah. Don't give I appreciate up. you sharing that. And Kyrie, real quick, we've got about a minute left. I just wanted to hear one last word from you regarding, you know, at this point, now that you've transitioned, do you feel like yeah. you found your identity, your niche, your purpose again, outside of the uniform? I'm glad you actually worded it that way, because that's kind of what the point I wanted to make. Also, just to find your niche. Like I said, I did have a couple good jobs people would consider. Like I worked for the social security claim specialist, but it wasn't my niche. Don't be afraid. Uh, as the previous young lady said, just to believe in yourself. Also, research, 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 research. Don't don't give up on yourself. Uh, if the job is not right for you, make sure you just keep going. Find what's right for you. Well, we really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, sharing, talking about purpose and identity and your transition. Um, we're going to be back here. Welcome. I want to make sure that we get uh, get a chance to to you know, continue this conversation later. When we come back, we will hear from the CalTAP program, a state resource for veterans in, tra in transition. So stay with us. Don't give Thank up. You. Go Army. See these hands? They grip the wheel of a Humvee in Afghanistan. These hands? Six years treating soldiers. 12 years. Flying choppers. My hands? They're here for the person who fought in Afghanistan. I made the call and got support for my sister. My hands are here for the person who treated those soldiers. I helped connect my son with the care he's earned. Mine take care of the person who flew those helicopters. And if life gets overwhelming, they're ready to dial the Veterans Crisis Line. The Veterans Crisis Line is here for all veterans and their loved ones. Call 1-800-273-8255 and press 1 or chat online at veteranscrisisline.net. Welcome back. We want to welcome your questions or your comments. So please give us a call at 925-313-1170 or send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices 1 or by email at veteransvoices at contracostatv.org. So now we want to continue our conversation about veterans in transition with Josh, with our Marine veteran, Josh Zebley of Caltap and Army veteran, Anthony Ghirardello. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Aaron. So in our previous um, segment, we talked to some veterans who have gone through the transition process, both of you also being veterans as well. Um, but you guys have a unique stance because you guys belong to some organizations that have been very helpful with veterans in transition. Um, so first, I'd like to start with you, Anthony. Um, just tell us a little bit about your service as well. I know we've got a couple photos highlighting your service and um, maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, what it takes to have, you know, a successful transition just based off of your experience um, with, your, with your program. Hey, Aaron, so I joined in 2012. I got out in mid-2018 and it wasn't uh, necessarily on my terms. I got medically discharged. So that whole transition for me was, you know, kind of, uh, 
it wasn't as traditional and it wasn't on my own terms. Uh, and so, you know, coming back out of the station out in Virginia and, uh, you know, coming back home to California, literally, you know, clear across the country, uh, trying to get back in the swing of things. I didn't know what I was going to really do, honestly. Um, what I was doing in the military wasn't something that I wanted to continue to do. Um, so I had to find a way to, whether it be job placement or whether it be education to kind of figure it out. And, uh, and so I initially got out. I did a lot of volunteer working um, uh, just to kind of get my foot in the door with different veteran-based organizations. Um, and that kind of helped out just kind of get in the swing of things. And, uh, and then um, started going to school through the VRE program uh, and ended up getting uh, a, a work-study position over at the Sacramento Veterans Center been there for about seven months now um and again that was it was just another way for me to try to get my foot in the door because you know at the end of the day i found uh you know that uh you know, repurposing myself was to help other veterans because that transition that like we're all talking about is you know it's it's it can be rough you know and especially if you don't you know you don't know uh you don't know where to go or what you know or who, who to talk to or what initially so you know, reaching out to other veterans and reaching out to different organizations that are veteran based was uh, really helpful to me. Um, and it continues to be, um, so yeah. And I mean, like I said, where I'm at now is, uh, definitely, you know, rewind a couple of years back. I didn't think I would I'd be where I'm at now. You know what I mean? Uh, but it's been really helpful just reaching out to other veterans, honestly. And also it sounds like you're paying it forward too, you know, by being a part of a vet center, um, and also continuing your service in that way. So we like to hear too from um, from Josh as well. If you can go ahead and tell us a little bit about you, sir, your service, and just you know, just some keys to successful transition, just based off of the program that you represent. All right, no problem. Thank you for having me. So my name's Josh. I joined the Marines in late 1990s and exited in the early 2000s. Um, I, I knew in high school. You know, I went to a little bit of college before I joined the Marines. I knew I was going to be, I wanted to be a Marine and nothing was going to stop me from doing that. Um, I'd say my transition, um, it was, it was good, but it took me a long time to really find um, my purpose, how I felt like I was giving, I didn't even know that I wanted to give back to the, to the veteran community um, until I, until I found this job that I'm currently in that I'll speak a little bit about um, um, as the section chief of the transition assistance program at the California Department of Veterans Affairs. My job is to, to help exiting service members. So it's really nice to hear um, the story from, uh, from Dre and Kyrie and Anthony um, and Ron about how you, you found a place uh, now that you, you feel happy and you're contributing to society and you're helping um, other, other veterans um, lead successful transitions. I think Ron said it, um, you gotta have a plan I mean, you can have plans and um, and backup plans and backup plans, and you got to find a mentor. I think that that's more important because a lot of us we don't know what we don't know. I mean, I often find um, things out there that I, I had no idea that even existed. If I would have known, my big phrase that we try and not hear the most from veterans is, "I wish I would have known about that." So our job is really to not hear that phrase. If I don't, if I don't ever, once I stop hearing that, I think I can retire. I think we can all retire. I wish I would have known about this benefit or that benefit. Um, and that's all of our job. I think that's what the purpose of this in, uh, this in, entire show is to help veterans uh, transition and let them know what's out there and how to succeed. Well, speaking of benefits, we actually do have a question from an audience member. Um, it says here, what is the one benefit that more veterans should use? So in your experience, I know you just mentioned that, so it probably goes right along with what you were just saying. I, I think the, the most important thing that it kind of has to do with transition is definitely, um, um, Nathan can attest to this, um, I think you need to talk to your county veteran service officer um, immediately after exiting the military or prior to actually, depending on the location, because um, what that, the veteran service officers in each county, each county has one in California, they're the ones that know about the benefits that are going on in, in your individual county or area, and they can help you uh, with, with school, with the GI Bill, um, the Calvet tuition fee waiver. So I'd say getting connected with them. And even if you're not service connected, even if you don't have a service connected disability, there's a lot of other things out there that are available to you that uh, may be a benefit to you to use that word. So I, I'd say visiting your, your county veteran service office is the most, most important thing. It's not technically considered 
um, a benefit. I mean, there's a ton of benefits that everybody needs to at least take a look at and know they're there, right? If we go back to that, I wish I would have known about, I could use the CalVet tuition fee waiver, which is uh, widely underused. Um, uh, Voc Rehab, which is a vr &E now, CalVet Home Loans. Um, I think you're going to share my uh, our webpage or our address soon. And whoever um, whoever has a question, feel free to reach out to us and we can tell you about all of those benefits. Yeah, thanks for that. I agree wholeheartedly, Josh. I think I wish I would have known about County Veteran Service Offices when I first got out too. It took me a couple of years yeah. to actually come across them. So, and you know, I think one thing about CVSOs is they work really close with vet centers and there's not a vet center in every county, but I worked both for the vet center in Concord and for the Contra Costa County Veteran Service Office and know that the relationship between these two agencies is very strong. So Anthony, give our audience a little bit of an understanding of how the vet center program along with CBSOs complement that, that seeking out a benefit that really is going to help veterans. So I can attest to, I mean, even just today, I was, you know, working before this show and I can attest to a lot of phone calls that we get that are benefit related. Um, the vet center itself is for readjustment counseling for uh, either the veteran themselves or family members. Um, but I mean, like like uh, Joshua was saying, like you were saying, as far as the connection goes, um, when it comes to benefits, I mean, we have all the resources under the sun uh, right there. Um, so when veterans reach out, you know, we're able to either direct them to the, you know, the county VSO or, you know, have the resources on hand there. And like Joshua was saying, as far as uh, make it a point to get to the VSO when after you, you get out, because you know whatever el you know whatever benefits you might be eligible for. Also, if it's not directly veteran related, because they're within that county, they might have also you know specific county resources as well. I mean, I myself when I first got out went through a, a California grant um, for security training, um, and it wasn't it was a veteran friendly program, but it wasn't directly related. So. I mean, there's so many different, uh, uh, you know, benefits that uh, veterans may be eligible for, uh, not only through the VSO, but also through the county and the state. So, and uh, Joshua and, and the VSOs themselves are, you know, really uh, you know, uh, aware, especially when it comes to how, how close the re related are to their, you know, specific counties. Yeah, I think it's hard sometimes for our audience to understand the, the different components that exist here. There are such... Uh, incredible layers of resources available to veterans, some right in their own county, right in their own community, within their own state. And we're very fortunate in the state of California to have California Department of Veterans Affairs and this CalTAP program. I remember Secretary Mbassiani, when he was first starting to talk about CalTAP, he said, you know, you get the opportunity to go through the transition assistance program when you leave the military, but not everyone gets that opportunity, particularly those that are coming home from overseas. I know a lot of Vietnam vets were in the jungle one day and then were home out of the uniform the next. There was no opportunity for transition. So Secretary Mbassiani's thing was CalTAP is available for that veteran at any point in their life. It's not just that last week of your military experience. If you've been out of the military for a while, programs like California Department of Veterans Affairs and the Vet Center are something that any generation of veteran can walk right in the door. These organizations are phenomenal. Um, I'm so, so proud of our state, I'm so proud of our nation for making this array of benefits available to our veterans. These are the benefits the veterans earn. Josh, what is the biggest struggle you think as an organization in actually reaching out to a veteran and giving or connecting with them and giving them that confidence that you are actually there in a way to help them? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, I'd say there's there's a significant number of veterans who do not want to talk to the federal government, the state government, the county government, um, maybe based on some past experience, uh, or they don't have access to um, the internet, or they they're not on a, a they're not part of the community college campus, they're not at a base. So really locating them on other avenues like like um, the show here. Um, word of mouth through other veterans, I think is a great way to do that. I'm letting them know that um, we're, we're here for their entirety. Like you said, Nathan, we, we're here for veterans that were um, Vietnam, um, Gulf, Gulf War, whatever era they were in, whatever camping their campaign they were in, that's what we're here for. So the struggle is letting people know about CalVet. A lot of folks did not even, don't even know about CalVet because they, they kind of, when we talk to them, they think, what are you guys in the VA? I said, no, we're not exactly the VA. We're 
a little more focused on California state specific benefits. And once, once we tell them that and like, okay, well, let's hear about it. And then I see um, one of the questions, um, I don't know if we have time for the question in the chat there, um, but I'd like to get into that. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, you can, please address that. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, question, the question is, what type of services does CalTAP have for family members? Well, first of all, all of the trainings that we do that are either in person um, or via a virtual training through webinar, they're open to service members, veterans, and their families. We stress and their families um, because I, I, I've noticed a lot of times, especially active duty, um, the spouse is the one that's paying a little more attention than the service member. The service member is thinking about what's happening at their job. The spouse is thinking about what's happening, you know, a couple months down the road. So everything that we are going to talk about is open to service members or, or it's open to family members also. Um, there's the CalVet tuition fee waiver. Um, I won't get too deep into that. You could definitely contact Nathan about that. Um, so it's the, basically if you have a 0% service connected disability or higher, you're dependent, depending on the plan that you're on, can go to any UC state school or um, community college tuition free. There's a couple of uh, small stipulations and small, free, small fees, but generally I'd say Nathan, 99% of people probably qualify for that. Um, we can give you some more information about that. A lot of folks don't know about that. Yeah, you know, also, um, Anthony, I wanted to include you in that conversation as well from a vet center uh, perspective as well, as far as any support that you guys may um, offer for family members. Yeah, so it's not just for the veterans uh, themselves, also um, for uh, their, their spouse, one-on-one um, -on -one counseling uh, with them as well, because it's not, as far as the whole encompassing mental health aspect, it's not just the veteran themselves, it, you know, it affects everybody within the family, um, so uh like I said, whether it be the spouse or uh, also grievance counseling as well. Um, if, if a loss of the veteran or the, the veteran themselves lose a family member. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's all encompassing. It's not just the veteran themselves. Yeah, I think that's important because we oftentimes think of the veteran in the transition process, but forget that the family also transitions along with them. Many families mm -hmm. live right there on base and have been moving around for years. And just like uh, was really given the example in terms of um, the first segment, a lot of those family members really may have the same struggles in terms of finding jobs. They've been highly qualified in terms of their experiences moving around and having to adapt and be very versatile and such. And suddenly they're out in a civilian world themselves being faced with issues of lack of recognition of their, their true skill set. So any last words, Josh and Anthony, we have about 30 seconds in regards to how organizations like yours can help veterans. For us, I'd say um, just take a look at the, the CalTAP, CalVet website, contact your CVSO, your vet center, um, any local resource you have at a community college, everyone on this call is a great resource. Um, reach out to them. We I think we're all naturally um, want to lead and help other veterans succeed in their families. Um, so there's there's never a time that we would um, we just won't be here for an ear. You to ask us a question. I'd rather uh, I love stupid questions because um, what people could perceive as stupid questions in their own mind because I I don't think that exists. Um, just don't be afraid to reach out to anyone on this call for sure. Well, thank you both very much, and Anthony and Josh. We really appreciate the work the vet centers and Cal. California Department of Veterans Affairs and the CalTAP program do every day for our families and their veterans. Uh, when we come back, we will hear from some national organizations dedicated to helping veterans in transition. So stay tuned. How do we thank you? How do we even begin to thank you for all that you have sacrificed to defend the country we love in the place we call home. You have chosen to put the nation before yourself. You inspire us. Now let us inspire you. Your national parks are places of recreation, connection, healing, and remembrance. Thank you for your service.
Welcome back. We're having a very important conversation tonight. We're talking about the transition from service to civilian life. We want to welcome you to contact us with your questions. We want the audience's participation in tonight's conversation about transition. Call us at 925-313-1170. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One or email veteransvoices at contracostatv.org. Now we'll be shifting this conversation slightly and talking with Navy veteran Angela Brush of Team Rubicon and Chris Lord of Team Red, White, and Blue. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I like, you know, I, I, Chris, welcome back. You've been on here before, but yeah, something I didn't notice in the past is that both these organizations are called Team. You know, Team Red, White, and Blue, Team Rubicon. What a great way to provide a structure for veterans to move from one team in the military to a team in the civilian world. So give us a quick synopsis um, of what these organizations do for our veterans community. Angela, let's start with you. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's actually uh, interesting that you call it uh, or that you brought up the fact that we're a team. Uh, so Team Rubicon is a national uh, organization that uh, responds to natural disasters. Uh, we've also recently pivoted to uh, help with um, responding to the coronavirus. And, um, you know, it's it's interesting that um, as far as the team aspect goes, and, um, you know, everyone tonight has mentioned a lot about mentorship. Um, and that's that's really the the big part I think that Team Rubicon has to offer is the community aspect. Um, and I know, you know, Team Red, White and Blue does as well. Um, the, the community feel that you have from being in the military and being in uniform with your brothers and sisters that interestingly enough is my blood brother. Um, but being in, in uniform with your brothers and sisters in arms, you know, you don't really have that in in the civilian world. And so having these nonprofit organizations that um, have that community feel and, and can help you know, gather people around you that have had similar experiences, that is, I think, um, one of the best things that we have to offer. The same here, Chris, uh, Chris as well, um, you know, just kind of working along the same theme of team, you know, maybe uh, talk about team red, white, and blue as well. And, and just that same or maybe different aspect of, of the team aspect. Yeah, we are also a national nonprofit. We have chapters all across the country and our chapters are led by volunteers and they do an amazing job of creating a, a team feeling by building authentic relationships. And you can see from the photos, it's kind of a compilation of, of some of what our chapters do. That's, you know, a rock event and band. That's a hike in Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, that's our Wad for Warriors. Every year we have CrossFit gyms all across the country who jump on board to do a fitness event. And, you know, we try to provide that team feeling a new sense of community for veterans when they leave the military service. Um, one of the things I really love about this space is we also collaborate with amazing organizations like Team Rubicon. You know, Angela, if I can share, Angela's also a volunteer in our Sacramento chapter of Team Red, White, and Blue. So there's this amazing overlap of membership. And, um, you know, if you join one of our organizations, chances are really good that you're going to learn about another partner organization. And I think that's been something that's traditionally existed within our veterans organizations. Members of the American Legion tend to also become members of the VFW and they want to do more when they find an organization that's really co contributing a lot. And you know, I, I love those pictures because it, it is so inspiring to see that, you know, getting out of the military, there's the opportunity to go out and do, have adventure, you know, seek out opportunity to, to, to do meaningful things for our communities. What would you say that veterans when they leave the military are most attracted to? What, where do you really find, we talked about the niche earlier in terms of job, but where's the niche in regards to staying involved with community? What, what are veterans looking for? Is that oh. Yeah, Angela, let's come Go to ahead. you. Okay, all right. Well, um, so, you know, I think um, one of the things that I really craved when I got out of the military was a, a sense of purpose again. 
um, it, you know, it's kind of uh, very well defined for you when you're in the military, what your purpose is. And I felt like I was just walking around in the dark with no batteries in my flashlight, trying to figure out what my new purpose was after getting out of the military. And, um, you know, the, the transition assistance class that the Navy had provided for me was three days. You know, they, they provided two months worth of training to teach me how to be a sailor, but three days worth of training to teach me how to be a civilian. And, and so it was hard for me to, you know, kind of find all of the resources and find the community that I really wanted to plug into. And there's, you know, there's so much out there in the big wide world, right? Well, you know, the thing that, that Team Rubicon in particular um, has to offer is that sense of community, that sense of purpose. Um, there's mentorship opportunities, there's instructor opportunities. Um, you know, in, in the military, you don't question whether or not you're making a difference. But as a civilian, sometimes you wonder, you know, and uh, as part of Team Rubicon, we don't have to wonder that anymore. So that's honestly one of the best parts I think about Team Rubicon. Um, it's it's just uh, the ability to come home at the end of the day and say, I've done a good thing. I've done yeah. a good work today. You know, what I find interesting and a, a, a common theme that we're finding throughout this discussion is the fact that during the transitional period, a lot of veterans um, kind of struggle with identity and struggle with that community aspect and that team aspect and that purpose. Um, and one thing that I'd like to point out, because we, uh, behind the scenes with our crew, all of us are veterans in some right too, and we all represent the different services. And one thing I'd like to point out about both of your organizations is that when you look at the photos, you look at those and you see people from every branch coming together, unified, being able to share stories. It's not about who's Navy and who's Army and who's this. Um, and I'm sure you guys get all that banter and all that back and forth too. Of course. But I think it's so cool though. Absolutely. I think it's so cool though to see everybody still come together in that community aspect, um, having that same um, camaraderie, maybe even using some of the same lingo and jargon. I know every branch has their certain, you know, specifics, but, um, you know, I just wanted to point that out. And I think, um, I don't know, maybe both of you guys experienced, maybe I'll toss this to you, Chris, you know, what are maybe some things that you have seen with regards to the fact that all these different service members from different branches are coming together in, in your organization? That's 100% true. You know, and I am a civilian in the organization. I'm the sister of an Army veteran. Um, but our organization is absolutely to enrich veterans' lives. And we want to also be um, an avenue for improved health and wellness and a feeling of community. And, you know, when my brother got out, these organizations didn't exist, and I wish they had, because, you know, those photos represent um, all branches of service. There's always good-natured ribbing still that I've been witness to, even if I'm not taking part of it as a civilian. Um, family members, you know, we yeah. want our veteran members to know that not only are they welcome, their families are welcome. You can bring your kids, you can bring your spouse, you can bring your friends, and I've had civilians ask me, you know, is it okay that I want to join your organization? And I let them know, like, absolutely. You might be the first cool civilian that a veteran has an interaction <laughs> with. And that's a really important thing. You know, the veteran only organizations are amazing. And I have so much respect. And we, we all play really well in the sandbox together, which I love. But I think the fact that we're open to civilian supporters, not just as members, but as leadership and staff, I think that is a really important piece of, of the transition. I agree that's, with you, but yeah. help us understand why that's important. Why is it important that civilians and veterans work together in, in these aspects? You know, there when there's any sort of big transition, you are gonna suffer a loss of routine and you're gonna lose your accountability buddies. And there's something about what I call a, like a shared suck fest, even like a Ragnar, you know, where you're just like a Ragnar trail event, Angela shaking or nodding your head. Like <laughs> you're sweating together, you're muddy, you haven't showered, you stink, you're sharing a tent with people you don't know. And then you're gonna go run a, you know, a six mile loop in the Tahoe Hills at three in the morning with a headlamp on. When you do stuff like that with people, you bond. And the fact that, I mean, I love that you said the word unity. Like I feel like our, our mission of both these organizations are very unifying because they're experiences that you can have together. 
and you're coming from all different backgrounds, but you can absolutely bond with those experiences. I'd actually like to jump on that as well, oh, if, if you have ahead. a moment. Yeah, um, no, so, we have a question, but we'll we'll get to that in a moment. We want to hear from okay. you. <laughs> all right, thanks. Um, so, you know, Team Rubicon is also open to civilians and uh, spouses and uh, friends, family members and whatnot. Um, and the, one of the things, you know, kind of like Chris is saying, when you're in the <laughs> the shared suck fest, if you will, <laughs> um, it's it is unifying. You have something to relate to each other about, you know? Um, one of the things that, that veterans struggle with when they get out is nobody understands the struggle that they've been through, right? So if they join an organization, say there's a husband and a wife that joins the same organization, right? You can, you know, in, in regards to Team Rubicon, right? You can go on a deployment, you can help out when a hurricane wipes out of town, and you have a shared experience at that point. You can relate to each other. You can, um, you know, come home at the end of the day and and talk about the things that that you now have in common that you don't have in common with anybody back home. Um, and so, so I think that's very important um, for organizations to offer. Absolutely. Um, kind of along those lines, so we're talking about teams and vets. Um, we did have a question from one of our audience members. Just ask him. Can older veterans join these teams if they aren't able to lift 100 pounds and run a six-minute mile? Great question. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And That's not me, by the way. I'm, <laughs> I'm not that older veteran. I'm gonna, we get a much question. older veteran asking that question. So I guess along those lines, is there like an age limit typically, or is it just kind of well open to all, you know, vets and in your case, you know, civilians as well? absolutely open to all and I'm smiling only because we get that question a lot people okay, do yep. see a lot of our running race photos but we are absolutely more than <laughs> running and I was trying to showcase that with some of those photos you know we our chapters do physical fitness events but they do purely social events they do service oriented events my Anchorage Alaska chapter just uh put together some care packages, and then in below zero weather, we're distributing them in Anchorage, Alaska to uh, people suffering from homelessness. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you get onto teamrdb.org, you can see just a whole rainbow of different types of activities that are not just fitness related, but I think still kind of all tap into the wellness piece of feeling connected. Well, I'd like to thank Absolutely. both of you, you know, for sharing information about both organizations, which seem amazing and, and, and beyond the transitional period for the veterans, but offers that camaraderie and that unity for the, their, their family members as well and civilians. That's great to hear that those organizations exist. And I do believe we have some contact information for both of your organizations. So again, thank you all uh, for your discussion tonight. We hope our conversation has shed some light on transition from service to civilian life. At the end of the show, we will give you some resources for those in transition. So now it's time to hear a veteran's voice. This month, Veterans Voices correspondent Stephen Burchick talks with Air Force veteran Dave Smith. My name is Stephen Burchick, and uh, today we're on our segment called A Veteran's Voice. And the veteran we're chatting with today is Dave Smith, Air Force veteran. Hello, Dave. How you doing? Steve, hi. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, great. Hey, uh, can you give us a, uh, a brief summary of your military experience and perhaps a, a highlight of that service? Sure. Uh, I, I actually grew up in an Air Force family as my father was a career Air Force officer. So we lived around the, all around the United States, but we also lived two years in Japan and three years in France. I then served uh, 25 years in the Air Force mostly as a navigator. I flew the B-66s in, um, during Vietnam. I flew KC-135s during the Cold War. And then I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to be uh, uh, in the unit that flew uh, government officials around the world. Dave, tell me a little bit about uh, some of the highlights with the flying the VIP unit. Well, my, my most favorable, favorite favorite. Uh, trip was actually, I actually got to fly the backup to the presidential aircraft uh, when uh, Reagan went up to Iceland 
for the Salt Two Tops with Gorbachev. That was a fantastic experience for me. The uh, president has his own crew that comes out of the squadron. The rest of us fly the vice president, cabinet members, and congressional delegations. Uh, two other highlights would be flying uh, Vice President Bush. Um, I flew him to Beirut when the Marine barracks were bombed. That was a secret mission. It was quite exciting time. Uh, and then uh, flying Vice President Quayle when he went down to uh, El Salvador um, for the inauguration of their president. Uh, that was my one of my last trips in the, in the unit. And, uh, That's a pretty impressive career, and you got some wonderful highlights there. Uh, Dave, uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, civilian life, uh, you know, career uh, after the service, as well as uh, some hobbies you might uh, have gotten involved with. Well, I, after I retired in 1993, I came back to the Bay Area. We had I'd been stationed at uh, Sunnyvale for a couple of years. We bought a house, and we were fortunate enough to keep it, so we were able to move back in. And I worked for three different uh, Bay Area telecommunications companies over the next 12 years. And when the second one went bankrupt, I decided it's probably time for me to look for another uh, line of work. In 2001, my younger son started wrestling. And uh, he, since I had wrestled in college, I decided uh, maybe I'll uh, become an assistant coach and help out. And I liked it so much. I did that for the next 14 years. Uh, and uh, that became my only job from 2005 till 2015. My proudest thing was I, Four of my wrestlers went to military academies, and I was also, uh, I think, influential. At least ten others joining the military, so I was very proud of that. And I fully retired in uh, 2015. Uh, you ask about my hobbies; it's uh, mainly traveling, since I've been traveling since I was a little kid with my family and throughout the Air Force. And my other hobby is uh, home brewing. Um, Brewing—that that sounds pretty cool. What, yeah, what style lot. of uh, brew do you uh, prepare? Well, the best thing about home brewers is they experiment a lot. So they brew just whatever they want, whenever they want. I started brewing because if you think back in the 80s, the majority of beers you could buy were only from the three major breweries, which are Budweiser, Coors, and Miller. And all they brewed was American light lagers. Well, having traveled throughout mainland Europe and Great Britain, I, was, I became much more used to more flavorful beers. The only way to get them back then was you brew them yourself. Of course, now you can go to any supermarket and get any uh, style of beer you want. And especially if you go to a liquor store, they, you can get all kinds of brews. But, but now I mostly just brew for special occasions. Well, that's pretty cool. And uh, it sounds like you started writing then and uh, doing traveling. So uh, understand you've written a book recently. Yeah, that, and in fact, that's kind of what, what caused me to... I started with that as writing these stories as a flying foam head. But when I retired from the Air Force, one of the other, a friend of mine from the Air Force, we decided we had been in the presidential unit so long, flying to all the capitals of the world. We said, let's see if we can go places where there aren't many tourists and there's some unusual exotic things going on. Well, that, that's great. What's the name of the book? Well, don't, don't get uh, turned off by this now, but it's called Trials and Travels with Old Drunks and Fools. By the way, how many countries have you visited, or how many places have you visited uh, so far? Well, places, uh, there's, there's no way to tell that. But countries, I've been to 140. Well, that, that is really interesting. Can you describe uh, a couple of the more significant trips uh, that you've been on? Well, yeah, uh, actually one of them, uh, you look at the background, I'm in Mount Fuji in Japan. Like I said, I've lived there for two years and I could see it right out my bedroom window. But my father would never let us climb it. It's, it's only climbable in July and August. And it's a birthright of Japanese to climb Mount Fuji once in your life, to see the sunrise over the empire. And uh, so I'd always wanted to climb it, but he wouldn't, wouldn't let me, I was so young. So in 1981, I had been at a conference, I was taken over, over in Japan, and I was able to organize a trip, get permission from the uh, commanders to go and spend the day climbing Mount Fuji. Now, most people take two days to climb it. It's not that it's a hard climb or anything like that, 
but there's so many people climbing it. And the whole idea is you want to be there to go to the top, be real near the top so you can get up in the morning, go to the top and see the sunrise. But we had to do it all in one day. So what happened was I had to first go to classes to get a Japanese driver's license, then know how to drive on the other side of the road, rent a car, drive three hours each way from, from the base we were at to Mount Fuji, and then do the hike. And the guys I, I took there with me, I says, guys, we aren't here for a, a, a lollygag up this mountain. We are on a mission. And I pushed them all the way up. Normal time up the mountain takes about six hours. We went up, we got up in three. But we were all marathoners at the time. But coming down, an earthquake hit. 5.8 on the Richter scale. And the thing about this earthquake was there were boulders up there that started coming down. One of the guys, if he hadn't, somebody hadn't shouted and he didn't look behind, if he had got hit by this one boulder, it would have killed him. From that point on, we ran down. When we got down, that's, that's, that's how the, the story, the guy wrote that poem was based on that and all the things that happened to us and what, what we got with this earthquake about God looking after us. That is great to hear. Hey, we really appreciate you sharing some time with us today. Uh, once again, a wonderful career, great stories, great book. Uh, Dave, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much, Steve. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for tuning into the show tonight. We hope our discussion has shed some light on military transition. Here are some resources if you want to find out more. The CalTAP program is dedicated to providing resources for veterans in transition. Find out more at calvet.ca.gov or call 800-952-5626. Team Rubicon provides transitioning veterans with a continued mission. Reach them at teamrubiconusa.org or call 310-640-8787. Team Red, White, and Blue connects veterans to their communities through social and physical activity. Go to teamrwb.org to connect with them. Veterans Voices is brought to you in part by contributions from the Veterans Affordable Home Program, serving those who have served us, ensuring the American dream for our veterans. The Diablo Valley Veterans Foundation, dedicated to helping veterans near you. To re-watch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider's schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also re-watch this episode and many others on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa, so be sure to subscribe. Our next show will air on Monday, March 8th at 7 p.m. We will talk about current events with an eye on the United States Capitol. Be sure to tune in. To all our veterans and their families, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.